Hello there. Silly moustache, wearing one of his Hawaiian shirts. Why am I wearing a Hawaiian shirt? Well, it all started quite recently when somebody commented about one of my guitars, my Dobro. And I thought I should do a video about resophonic guitars and um, and how they came about. Which is why I've got this to show you. This is a British made um, replica of a Weizenborn guitar. This was made by um, David Gosden in Hampshire and he makes excellent Hawaiian guitars, or he did when he made this, I don't know whether he's still in the business. Let's talk about what Hawaiian music, what do you think about that? What's the first picture? Okay, apart from the beautiful ladies covered in flowers and um, swiveling hips and things like that. Get away from that. No. Let's think about the music. Ukuleles, yeah, okay. And um, that's... sliding guitar effect. Very stories about how this developed in Hawaii. One story is that a gentleman called Joseph Kakuku was walking along a railroad track, saw um, uh, an unused or a discarded railroad spike and took it home and then looked at his guitar which possibly needed a neck reset, very big high action, and he went and so made himself a more usable steel. Uh, open tuning, of course, this is tuned to C, approximately. Um, and um, the sound of the Hawaiian guitar was born. Something like that. Um, the originals of these were made in um, uh, from about 1923, but I should go back a little bit. Hawaiian music was a fairly localised thing in the islands um, until about 1906. Recovering from the San Francisco earthquake, uh, there was a large exhibition held and, um, and they invited representatives from all the countries in the world, world exhibition, to come along and um, Hawaii was included as an independent country then um, and uh, they had musicians playing Hawaiian music all the time. And from there the fashion or the craze for Hawaiian music spread across um, the USA and further afield into Europe and everything. As a music form gets popular the audiences get larger. That means larger venues, that means more need for volume, for sound. Um, so Hermann Weisenborn, a German gentleman, um, redesigned guitar to project more and, um, and his version was, although it's a rather thin body, there are deeper version, uh, deeper bodies around, but the neck is completely hollow, so there's an awful lot of resonance in there. No, it's not the ideal um, design, but it was a very popular design. And um, it disappeared in, within the 20s pretty much, although he made in small numbers up until 34. Um, but uh, you will have seen this more recently um, by, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, Harper, um, Ben Harper, and that brought it to my attention again. But I bought this because I was playing in a duo where we were playing 20s and 30s stuff, and with not a little influence from um, Leon Redbone, bless him. 
and so um, I was playing this with two friends for a while and that's your Hawaiian guitar but it wasn't loud enough and we still hadn't got to magnetic pickups and things like this 1923 that started they, they were being made uh, usually out of koa which is a Hawaiian wood uh, that one was all mahogany I don't know whether the wood is very very particular to the sound um, one of the guys working in Weizenborn small factory was a guy called John Dopira, a Slovakian gentleman who with his brothers came over to went over to the USA um, in the early 1900s and started working as carpenters I think in New York and then when the San Francisco earthquake of 1904 hit uh, they went over there uh, and um, made good with their carpentry work um, fixing up uh, damaged buildings and things. When that had been all sorted out they moved down to uh, I believe Los Angeles and they went back to their ideas or at least one of them went back to their idea of reinventing a loud violin and one of the things, one of the influence was um, uh, using a resonator that was used in pre-electric gramophones, which was basically an aluminium cone that was irritated by the noise of the needle transferred somehow, and then shot out through a great big ear trumpet, or trumpet, I should say. Um, and then he met up with a guy called George Beecham, who was a performer, and a little bit of a wide boy, a little bit of a commercial um, minded guy and he said I want you to build me a guitar that would be really loud and uh, and I can play Hawaiian as well so a company called the National Guitar Company was formed and they made metal bodied guitars with three small aluminium cones and it was called strangely enough the tricone now you might have expected me to be sitting here with a tricone. Uh, I've never owned a national tricone um, but these three cones were linked together with a T-bar and across the T-bar was a bridge where the strings exerted the tension on it and that excited these three cones and they um, played into, into the metal body and it was very very loud. It designed for Hawaiian guitarists and also for Hawaiian style guitarists I should say and also for um, uh, guitarists in jazz bands and dance bands. Very loud, very heavy. They brought out another style, which was the single cone. And again, I'm sorry, I don't have a metal bodied. I had a beautiful style O Deluxe metal bodied, which I swapped for this wooden bodied one because it sounded beautiful, but it was too loud and it was too heavy and I got a backache after playing it for five minutes. Um, so they made tricones and single cones working on the same basis. This has a cone which faces into the instrument and on the top of the smallest part of the cone there is a round piece of wood with a saddle across it. And so that's called a biscuit. And they made these for, again, dance bands and to be played in a Hawaiian um, style. Uh, about 19, late 1920s, everything was changing very, very, very fast in those, at those times. Um, and then Mr. Dopera fell out with George Beecham and went off, uh, gave up all his rights to the business and went off and formed another company with his brothers. And the company was called Dobro, as with many Eastern European um, languages, Dobro means good. Um, so it was good, and it was the brothers, Dobro. It was a very good um, trade name. But George Beecham and company had the patents on that style of cone, so these invented a slightly different one. This cone is facing out. Um, and so um, it's seated with the, um, the smallest part of the cone in the back of the machine, in the back of the box, radiating out. And um, the bridge sits on a 
piece of aluminium called a spider, which is rather strange because it's only got six legs. But it's still in a very basic body. Both of these are solid laminated boxes. They're, there's no acoustic properties to the, um, to the body to speak of. Square neck. Um, it's never going to be played other than horizontally. Now both of these designs were coming and going and, um, and uh, all really focused about Hawaiian music. And by the time these things came out, everybody lost interest in Hawaiian music. And those that did moved to the electric steel guitar, which was basically a slab of wood with strings strung across it and a magnetic picker. And you know the rest with that. So this, um, this guitar and this guitar were virtually um, pawn shop food um, and um, no one really wanted them but being relatively well made instruments and loud they found a market in the less affluent parts of the community and uh, for this sort of shape things up cheap they were loud and um, and so they, they found that other market For the Dobro with its square neck and they did round neck and square neck versions all, all of these um, this was a bit sweeter sound and of course you could play uh, blues on it um, a few people hung around playing uh, acoustic Hawaiian on it. But, um, a strange place, it found a home in country music and bluegrass. Um, Bill Munro, the father of bluegrass, never accepted a dobro as a bluegrass instrument, but, um, uh, uh, Flat and Scruggs did, uh, and um, so it became a fundamental part of a lot of bluegrass bands, and I'm grateful for that. And um, it was somebody that remarked on this instrument in another video that made me think about putting this together. Uh, the story for this guitar um, was uh, rather interesting because it belonged to a good friend of mine, and we used to sit and play in here together. And um, I always loved the look of this particular Dobro. Mine was much more basic, much more plain, but it sounded perfectly fine. Um, and uh, then my friend George started getting seriously ill. And um, uh, one day he said to me, we both know that I'm never going to play Dobro again. And um, so I've been thinking, uh, you've always been jealous of this guitar, haven't you? And I said, well, I think it looks very nice. Um, I always preferred the sound of mine, but, but yeah, it looked, looked pretty. And he said, I think you ought to have it. So um, he gave it to me, which was very nice of him. Um, but I felt a bit guilty about it because he and his wife were going through difficult times. He was terminally ill. And so um, later I contacted her and I sent her a reasonable price for it. Um, so then, uh, soon after I got it, I used it uh, in a recording that I was making with, um, with a friend and it sounded absolutely horrible. And um, the album was a bit of a tragedy really. And uh, I couldn't work out why I was playing out of tune on this. And um, I finally 
um, contacted the resonator guitar expert in the UK and he said when was it built? And I said 1999. So he said, oh, it was built by Gibson then. So I said, oh, was it? It's got Dobro on the head. He said, yeah, they bought out Gibson um, in 97, I think. He said, and they got the plans, but they built them wrong. Uh, how wrong? And he said, well, the intonation will be between a quarter and a half inch out. Bring it over and I'll have a look. Yeah, it, the intonation was way out. They put this in the wrong pot, all right? Um, I don't know how they managed to do it and whether it was contrived when um, the name and the brand was sold to Gibson, um, but um, there was another um, company who uh, made um, extremely, still do make extremely good uh, Dobros called um, Beard. And this was such a common occurrence that they made a kit with a spider that compensated for that, um, that inaccuracy. So we got one of those kits and he did some other working out and he's made this into a very fine dobra. But um, be very wary of any dobra that's been made by Gibson. Um, so there we are, that's, that's how these instruments developed. Uh, the, um, the, the, the National found its home in the blues players and the Dobro found its home in country and bluegrass. The Weizenborn shrunk into obscurity really until a chap called Ben Harper came along and started playing it excellently, but in a very non-Hawaiian way. And then there was another boost and that's when I think Peter Gostin started making these in the UK. And there's a number of people. And they do have special qualities. Almost everybody that plays them has a magnetic pickup which I think is rather a shame. But there you are, slidey guitars. You'll notice that I didn't play an electric sl style. I don't do that. Anyway, if you have been, thank you for listening, and uh, I hope that was of some interest to you. Much more accurate history on the uh, Hawaiian guitar and the steel guitar are things available online and elsewhere. And um, the people who are making national guitars now call themselves the National Resophonic Company and they're also based in, um, I think, St. Louis Obispo in, in Southern California. And they got lots of plans from one of the surviving Dopera um, um, brothers or family and uh, with the help and research for a chap called Bob, Bob Brosman, who also revived the, um, the interest in, uh, in resophonic guitars, uh, they, they reformed a company and their instruments are probably of better quality than the originals. That's a personal opinion. Um, but anyway, I hope that's of interest and uh, well, thanks for watching. Bye.